Welcome to Continuing Mobile Education for Emergency Medical Services Providers. This is Neonatal Resuscitation, Episode 3, Understanding Transition and Managing Unstable Infants. After watching this episode, participants should be able to understand transition of neonatal circulation and oxygen delivery, recognize common complications seen in newborn infants, and understand initial management of unstable newborn infants. To better understand what you need to do um, to provide uh, um, support for the newborn infants, you need to understand a little bit about the transition from um, being a fetus to a newborn infant. And uh, in utero, uh, the fetus uh, gets all its oxygen from the mother uh, through the placenta. And after birth, um, essentially a couple things need to happen um, in order for the baby to transition properly without getting into trouble. Um, the first thing that happens, or one of the first things that happen, is that the, uh, the lung, which is normally fluid-filled inside the mom, um, it, uh, the fluid becomes reabsorbed and the lungs are cleared of this fluid so that the baby could um, have proper oxygen exchange through the alveoli and into the circulation. Uh, the second thing is that the infant also needs to um, establish spontaneous respirations. Um, and the last thing is that uh, the, the infant uh, goes from fetal circulation to normal newborn circulation. So uh, part of um, uh, helping the baby uh, transition, what you want to do is um, make sure if there's any oral secretions to clear the, uh, the mouth, um, either if, if with a bulb suction or if you don't have a bulb suction, use a cloth and gently wipe the mouth clean. Um, if you have a suction um, a catheter, you could also uh, suction from the esophagus. Um, and then. Providing the stimulation will help the baby establish uh, spontaneous respirations. It's not necessarily needing oxygen um, uh, for the baby to transition properly, but the act of the infant taking the first breath and breathing in and out um, helps clear that fluid out of the lung and, and also um, maintains a healthy circulation. Uh, before the baby is born, um, the placenta does the majority of the um, oxygen exchange and um, by clamping the cord, you're essentially taking the placenta away, which is a low resistance um, uh, uh, circulatory system. And by doing that, you're, um, you're increasing your systemic circulation. And at the same time, while the baby starts breathing, the pulmonary vascular resistance comes down, the pulmonary uh, blood vessels uh, basal dilate and, and therefore more oxygen is, um, uh, can be exchanged and uh, transported to the rest of the body. If the infant does not uh, do all these things, um, then uh, uh, he or she could get into trouble and, um, uh, and go into acidosis and decrease oxygen tension in the blood. Um, babies also with the, uh, this added stress, um, they need to have um, a, a normal glucose levels. Um, and uh, if, uh, uh, because uh, glucose consumption is important for, um, to aid in this um, transition process. And um, if there are low glucose stores and you have a baby who is in respiratory distress, then um, the infant is not gonna be able to um, breathe and, or give, give uh, have the energy um, uh, needed to uh, maintain proper respirations. Many, many things, as you can imagine, go, can go wrong uh, during this process. It's, it's very, very dramatic, uh, literally in a matter of seconds as this is happening. Some babies do require uh, many, many minutes to perhaps even hours to transition appropriately. We call this transitioning. So what you might see is a baby that is uh, temporarily breathing a little bit more quickly than you would like. Perhaps their breath sounds are a little bit more coarse than you would like to see. But often within 20 minutes or so after birth that that will uh, almost spontaneously, I'm sorry, almost totally resolve. Uh, you can of course just support the baby through this. Uh, again, needing to know that one of the most important things you can do for these newborn babies is to make sure that they are in fact uh, nice and warm and are maintaining their body temperature. And again, having them be awake and be stimulated so that they are in fact taking good, big, deep breaths 
uh, is, is a very good thing to do. I often tell parents that I'm not trying to be mean to your child, but the more that your baby cries right now, uh, the better off that they're going to be, the more open their lungs will be, uh, the drier their lungs will be, and the easier it will be for the blood to circulate appropriate through their body. To review, during transition, the lungs need to clear of any fluids. Providers can assist the newborn with this by gently suctioning any secretions from the mouth and nose. Also, the infant needs to establish spontaneous respirations. Providers can assist the newborn with this by providing stimulation. Lastly, fetal circulation must convert to newborn circulation. After clamping the cord, providing good respiratory support as needed is the biggest key to ensuring this transition is successful. One of the things um, that you may encounter is a blue floppy baby. And what you need to do at, right after delivery is to make sure that you have um, a good bulb syringe. And what you're going to do is to suction out their nares and their mouth and make sure you have you clear that airway. Your airway is probably one of the most important things to a successful resuscitation. So you always want to depress the bulb syringe before you go near the infant's face because it can shoot out some air and you don't want to startle the infant to have them um, suction in some of that mucus. So you'll always depress the bulb while you're away from the infant's nares and then go into the nares and suck out. You also want to make sure that you get in their mouth really good to press your bulb syringe and clear their oral secretions before you do anything of bagging and masking or giving oxygen. Always make sure that um, the head of the infant as well is in a good position where they can have a nice patent airway. You don't want to make sure that their head is too hyperextended because they can cut off their airway. The biggest part of the infant is their head when they're born and they can um, bring their head down to their chest and that can also um, cause them to cut off their airway as well. Initially when a baby is um, born, uh, sometimes the baby uh, does not start breathing spontaneously and uh, we call this apnea. Uh, and there are two types of apnea in the newborn. There's primary apnea and secondary apnea. With primary apnea, um, the infants, um, um, uh, the rest of the vital signs are okay, the heart rate is okay, the blood pressure is okay, but the infant just needs a little bit of stimulation um, by the provider to remind, um, remind him or her to breathe. And usually, if an infant is in primary apnea, all you need to do is stimulate the baby and to get the baby breathing. If um, the period of primary apnea um, uh, is overextended, so the heart rate starts um, uh, decreasing, and the, um, a late finding of, um, now we're going into secondary apnea, a late finding of is, is that the blood pressure will start uh, decreasing as well. So um, to help an infant out of secondary apnea, no matter how much tactile stimulation you give, um, the baby is not going to start breathing. So at this point, you need to give positive pressure ventilation with a bag and mask. Um, and generally speaking, the longer the infant is in secondary apnea, um, the longer it will, uh, you will need to get the baby out of secondary apnea uh, give, by giving positive pressure ventilation. If you need to give positive pressure ventilation, making sure the size of your mask is adequate is important. So you generally want to have a mask um, that covers the nose and the mouth, um, does not overlie the chin, and um, there's, uh, there are no areas for um, leaking of air. So this mask might be a little too small for this particular baby, um, only because it doesn't uh, cover uh, the, uh, the mouth um, well or completely. Uh, this mask uh, is probably the more proper size mask for our infants. And, and so when you select the mask, um, you want to hook it up to a bag. Go ahead and um, make sure you have adequate seal. Make sure that your baby's head is not over um, overextended or um, or hyperflexed. Um, hold the mask with with the C and E position for positioning, and then you would you would bag um, at a rate about uh, 60 breaths per minute until you get adequate chest rise. To review, if the infant is showing signs of respiratory distress or poor respiratory effort, suction secretions from the mouth and nose, position the airway appropriately, and manage apnea. 
This would include stimulating to encourage breathing during periods of primary apnea or providing positive pressure ventilation with a BVM during periods of secondary apnea. For infants, um, as you're assessing, uh, who appear to be poorly perfused, um, you may want to check the, uh, the capillary refill. And if it's prolonged, uh, which is uh, greater than three seconds, then the infant may be volume depleted. Um, and uh, if you have a history of um, maternal blood loss, if there's a placental abruption or something related to uh, maternal blood loss, then the chances are you, you would have uh, volume depletion in an infant who is poorly perfused. In these instances, um, uh, you can give normal saline um, as a volume expander um, or some kind of isotonic uh, solution. So the, the medication of choice would be normal saline, uh, 10 mLs per kilogram, um, and you would administer the normal saline um, at a minimum over five minutes. Um, you don't want to push uh, normal saline in because it is a lot of volume, and in, in the case of, of a premature infant, this type of rapid fluctuation in volume um, can precipitate intraventricular hemorrhage. For infants uh, who you are in the middle of resuscitating um, and the heart rate uh, remains less than 60, uh, uh, despite adequate uh, um, ventilation and positive pressure ventilation, then you, uh, you would initiate chest compressions. Uh, however, even with chest compressions, if the heart rate uh, remains less than 60, then uh, epinephrine may be indicated. Uh, for to increase uh, cardiac contractility uh, and the heart heartbeat. Uh, so the dose of epinephrine, um, the concentration is one to ten thousand, and the volume you would give would be anywhere from 0.1 to 0.3 mLs per kilogram of the baby's body weight. The preferred route to administer epinephrine is through either an IV, through the umbilical um, vein, or um, in some scenarios uh, through an intraosseous line. To review, for infants who are showing signs of poor perfusion as evidenced by delayed capillary refill, providers should consider fluid replacement using normal saline. If the infant's heart rate is below 100, they should be closely monitored and given supplemental oxygen and additional respiratory support. If the infant's heart rate drops below 60, chest compression should be initiated, and if the infant still doesn't improve, epinephrine may be indicated. As always, please remember to follow your local protocols. After watching this episode, participants should now understand transition and recognize its importance. Participants should also understand that most complications are respiratory in nature and respiratory support may be indicated. Also, participants should recognize that poor perfusion is often related to poor respiratory effort, but fluid replacement and epinephrine may also be necessary.